which is not good, then the role of accreditation becomes important, role of ranking becomes important. And as Indian universities right now are not in, say, top 100 world rankings, so it is important that people who are coming, I mean, the universities or institutions which are coming to India, they come to know about Indian institutions through our own rankings, through our own NAC ratings, through our own accreditation process. So that is what I'm trying to talk in a short time, around seven minutes given to me by Ashwin. So <clears throat> you all know that we have a new education policy, which is giving a lot of emphasis on benchmarking and uh, quality of higher education. And it is also giving a lot of importance on multidisciplinarity, multiple entry exit, uh, internationalization, which is something very, very important. For the first time, I think the policy has given this much of importance on internationalization of higher education. Uh, all this is because we want to improve the quality of higher education in India. We want to see that the India emerges as an affordable quality education destination for the world. So for that to happen, what is important for is accreditation, because without accreditation, we are not able to benchmark that which institution is standing where. So therefore, benchmark is very, very important. And in India, we have, when we talk of accreditation, we talk of two institutions. One is NASH, National Assessment and Accreditation Council, which is talking of institutional accreditation. And we talk of NBA, which is talking of program level accreditation. And of assessment of the students, what is the performance of the students and what is their learning outcome? That is, again, very important in the criteria, too. And very important thing which they do is student satisfaction survey, that how satisfied the students are while learning in that particular institution. Similarly, when we talk of criteria three, which is research, innovation, and extension, there the NAC is looking at the promotion of research and facilities, resource mobilization for research, because many a times the institutions are depending only on the government grant for research. So how much of resource mobilization is done by the universities, external resource mobilization for research, uh, how what type of innovation ecosystem is existing, whether the startups are there, whether the incubation centers are there, so all innovation ecosystem, what type of innovation ecosystem ecosystem is there, how many research publications are there, and when you talk of research publication, they do take care of only Scopus and UGC care list journals, not all the journals, so the publications in those journals, how much of consultancy money the university has earned means how many teachers are involved in the consultancy projects, how many extension activities, because universities are not only for teaching, learning, and research, they are also for extension activities, they are also for community development, because of the university, the society around the university should uh, develop, Therefore, for community engagement, how much of community engagement is there, how many collaborations are there. So these are the parameters which they see in criteria three. And criteria four is on in infrastructure and learning resources, that what type of infrastructure is existing, like physical facilities, again, physical facility and library as a learning resource, that how, what type of, say, built up infrastructure is there, how much of uh, library means not only in, the, in terms of uh, brick and mortar structure of the library, how many books, journals, all those things are there, he's nodding at me. And uh, <clears throat> similarly, we have criteria like student support and progression, that how the student support services are provided, governance, leadership, and mechanism. I think I will leave these criteria. I'll talk about in general, because he's nodding at me, <laughs> Ashwin. So what I'm trying to say is NAC is doing institutional accreditation, NBA is doing program-wise accreditation, that within the program, the uh, say, for example, engineering and management programs, whether they are accredited or not, NBA is binary. NAC is rated, I means they are grading in NAC, but NBA is uh, binary. Apart from that, we have NIRF, that is National Institute of Ranking Framework. Again, there are four or five parameters based on which the ranking is done on the, for the Indian universities, that how Indian universities are, and they are ranked from top 100. And many of the government schemes, for example, UGC scheme, are dependent on the NAC rating and NIRF ranking. For example, if you are in the category one institution, which is NAC A double plus, you are given a lot of autonomy. If you are in NAC, say, category two institution, uh, autonomy is there, but a little less than category one institution. But below that, there is very little autonomy available because uh, it is felt that you, the autonomy should be, as much autonomy sh should be given as you can handle, as the universities can handle. So it is expected that the good universities can handle autonomy in a better manner, therefore more autonomy is given. So benchmarking in Indian conditions is very, very important, especially with regard to the type of uh, 
autonomy you will get in your institutions for i mean academic autonomy or administrative open autonomy or financial autonomy so benchmarking in my opinion is very very important i'm not talking of international rankings because my future speakers are talking about international rankings so i'll finish my talk with that thank you very much thank you Thank you very much indeed, ma'am, for that insightful talk. And now I would like to invite our next eminent speaker for the special address, Professor Padma Kumar Nair. He's Director, Thapar Institute of Engineering and Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome sir. No, I would like to use... Uh, this mic. Can you hear me well? Because after lunch, uh, you all might uh, feel a bit sleepy. Let's have some fun. All right? So I'm supposed to talk about benchmarking, accreditation, ranking. You know, I, I, I remember a story. I'm from Kerala. I remember a story from my middle, you know, primary school days. Typically, every question, every exam would have a question about describe a coconut tree. Okay? Every kid would learn to describe a coconut tree. But unfortunately, one time it was about describe a horse. No way to describe a horse. This kid wrote, my grandfather used to own a horse. He used to tie it on a coconut tree. Then coconut tree is a tall tree and all kinds of things. So my passion is not benchmarking. My passion is not accreditation. My passion is not ranking. My passion is learning with my students. So my passion is actually excellence. What is excellence? Excellence is the notion of wanting to do it better than before. Especially a country like ours. We are not the richest country on uh, planet Earth. We are kind of trying to be one of the most interesting, beautiful places uh, to, to have a good life. So the idea of excellence is all about wanting to do it better than before. Wanting to do it better than before. So what is the challenge of the benchmarking? People ask me, is it useful? Absolutely, benchmarking is useful. Will it lead to excellence? Definitely not. So think about it. Benchmarking is useful, but it will not lead to excellence. Why? Because, first of all, you need to decide, decide what is world class and what is your goal. And somebody else have uh, designed for a particular context. You are looking at a particular university. History is different. Context is different. Societal expectations are different. Now you are going to benchmark by looking at that university. That's a problem, number one. Number two, if you start just straight going to that, your opportunities for innovation is lost. Number three, it becomes competitive. Everybody is chasing the same kind of end goal. I can go on and on and on talking about it. So the idea is, how do you use benchmark and achieve something wonderful for our society. I would call, we need to empathetically reframe what is higher education for. Have you thought about what is higher education for, or education in general? I would argue that there are three major goals of uh, education. Knowing yourself, self-knowledge, achieving intellectual freedom and intellectual humility, and finally, seeking excellence. One more time. Excellent seeking. What is excellent seeking? Wanting to do it better than before. And why do, you, why do we fail seeking excellence typically? You know, the time of Jugaad is more or less over. We were a poor country. We were somehow managing. Today, we are way more uh, well-to-do than so. But still, we are in that, uh, uh, trapped in that mindset of 50 or 100 years old. Today, what we need to do what is good for our society, what is good for our learners from 20, 30, 50 years from now, and we should start creating it from yesterday. That's the idea of, uh, that's why we call empathy is the mother of excellence. Why? We are learning and creating for others. When you think about others, there are two things. You need to understand their emotions, and also you need to be able to emote with them. So why don't we naturally do it? Because our brain is not wired to doing this. Think about the typical challenges our ancestors faced when uh, maybe two million years ago when they were wa wandering around in African savannas. The typical problems they have faced are simple, 
dangerous and problems needing immediate solution. Think about it. Simple, dangerous and problems needing immediate solution. But today's problems are not so simple. They're complex. They're typically not that dangerous. Most problems are. And solutions can wait. So this brain is wired to jumping into solution, jumping into solution. So this, even when there is no good science available to finding a good, beautiful solution, still we are supposed to act scientifically. That means even when there is no science, we act like we have it. This, this plan do, even without good science, so that causal approach is sometimes problematic. Again, is it useful? Yes, but we need to understand the limitation. So you need to have a causal and an effectual approach. Effectual approach is do, learn, adjust, and do. Finally, what do you do? Most important problems worth solving for the society are not simple, straightforward problems. In, a, in an article in, uh, written in 1973, two German scientists, Rittel and Weber, called or come, uh, came up with the notion of wicked problems. Plurality of stakeholders and plurality of problem definitions and expectations. How do you solve wicked problems? Continuous reframing. What should be the starting point of reframing? That is empathy. Let's slowly use benchmarking, but go beyond benchmarking through empathetic reframing. Empathy is the mother of excellence. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you very much indeed, sir. We did need that energy after the lunch. And now moving on to the next panel discussion session, which is on empowering excellence, the role of quality assurance, accreditation, and benchmarking in higher education. I have the privilege in inviting our distinguished moderator, Dr. Ashwin Fernandez. He is the executive director for uh, Africa, Middle East, and South Asia at QS. Quakarali Simons, the world's largest international education network. He works closely with institutions across the region to better understand the local content and to support the drive for excellence in capacity building. Dr. Ashwin Fernandez is known as an ambassador of the quality movement in education and has advanced the need for independent evaluation mechanisms for promoting excellence. He has authored a book titled India's Knowledge Supremacy, The New Dawn, which is thought-provoking perspective on evaluation of higher education in India since ancient times to now. It was released by Sri Dharmendra Pradhanji, the Honorable Union Minister of Education for India, in January 2023, this year. I also have the privilege in inviting uh, other eminent panelists onto the stage. I invite Mr. Matthew Johnston. He is Minister Counselor, Education and Research, Australian Government Department of Education, Australian High Commission, New Delhi. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Matthew Johnston. Warm welcome to you, sir. I invite Dr. Raghuraman, Dean Amrita School of Business and Director Center for Research in Analytics and Technologies for Education, Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peetam. Let's put our hands together to welcome, sir. I'm privileged to welcome Professor Dr. Nagajyoti Koripella, Director Research and Development, Best Innovation University. Warm welcome to you, ma'am. I also invite Dr. Tripti Vagmare, Executive Director, Academic Excellence, Quality Assurance, Datta Meghe Institute of Higher Education and Research. A very warm welcome to you. And with those words of introduction, I hand over to Dr. Ashwin Fernandez. Over to you, sir. You have about one hour, 10 minutes left with you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much and a very good afternoon. So I think we've, we've already heard and uh, our two distinguished speakers have already set the stage on the, uh, the importance or the role of benchmarking. Uh, but let me have first from the audience here, how many of you agree that benchmarking is important? All right, and the rest of you think benchmarking is not important? Or do you think the, bench, the role of benchmarking needs to be redefined? Okay, that's a, that's a good show of hands. Uh, now. The first, uh, in, in the opening statement, uh, we've had some very good thoughts on international universities which are coming to India and looking at various benchmarks uh, from uh, Pankaj Mittal uh, and the role of local accreditation, which is great. Uh, 
Uh, also, Professor uh, Padma Kumar spoke on excellence, the notion of doing uh, it better than before. Um, and uh, the benchmarking, which of course uh, needs to be redefined as well. Now, what I want to do is before I pose my question to our special address guests, I want to go around my four panelists and the special address guests here uh, later on, but I will give the opportunity to the four of you all to echo your thoughts in maximum four minutes. Do you, again, agree with our audience? We have a lot of show of hands who said they agree with benchmarking. Do you agree with our audience first? And what are your thoughts at your institution? So we have four university, three university representatives and one from a country representative representing Australia. So we would like to first hear the thoughts. We heard India. Now we'll go over to Australia. And I would first like to invite uh, Matthew to talk about benchmarking and what do you think and what do you think the, the case of Australia in this case? Thank you very much, Ashwin, for the introduction. And um, thank you very much, Vicky, for inviting me today. I'm very pleased to be able to talk about um, benchmarking, quality assurance, or accreditation. Um, these are many of the words that are used, I think, sometimes interchangeably, but sometimes have different meanings uh, looking at the context. So Australia has a very well-established national uh, accreditation system. Many of the domains within our quality assurance system are very similar to those seven that uh, Dr. Mittal mentioned in her presentation. And I was listening, when I was listening to Dr. Mittal, I was quite struck at how the domains for quality assurance for NARC here in India are very much similar to those domains that we use in Australia under our national quality assurance framework. So we have a single national regulator uh, in Australia which applies and measures institutions according to legislated standards that we call our higher education standards. Those are in legislation and all of our universities and colleges are applied to the same standards. So the standards are implemented consistently. What's not done consistently, and I think this is where uh, you know, benchmarking is very important and it is good, but we also need to think about institutions from a, from a government perspective, we need to think about institutions about where we want them to go and being organic uh, and living organisations that are full of people. And so our uh, regulatory framework uh, in Australia is risk-based. So those uh, universities, that are uh, you know, well established, have a proven record for, for delivery, are self-accrediting. They, they can accredit courses, they can enter international partnerships, they can even go and set up campuses overseas, and our regulator will check in where they are doing new activities. They are trusted. We then apply stronger auditing or uh, risk sort of interrogation to new and emerging courses or new and emerging colleges. The reason for this is that what we want to do in our framework and what I think a good benchmarking framework should do, and we heard this from Dr. Mittal as well, is encourage all of our institutions to take the commitment personally or for the institution personally to strive for quality and excellence. And we do this by measuring what are the student outcomes. So our institutions are measured and funded by the government according to different international st uh, different student surveys that happen for both international students in Australia but our Australian domestic students. It's a very important input and those learning outcomes are critical for assessing whether an institution is truly delivering on what we want in terms of a high quality education. But what we really see in our framework and what I want to talk about, hopefully if we get time through the Q&A, is what's the cycle of quality assurance within an institution and how can governments incentivize this? So it's not about a big stick, it's more about encouraging people to be wanting to do better and be rewarded for doing better. And so a couple of the things that I will talk a little bit about is the role for quality assurance as a mechanism for internationalization but really I want to draw out a few practical examples from a government perspective of how we do internationalization within institutions and the role that quality assurance and different toolkits and practices that you can implement in institutions contribute to that overall goal of uh, institutions becoming you know more highly ranked 
uh, in international rankings, but also actually delivering better outcomes uh, for students. So I guess my summary of my presentation is benchmarking is important. Students have to be at the core and we have to know that they are gooding, getting good outcomes and then we need institutions to take on the, um, the mission of quality assurance and increasing quality uh, quite personally. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, on that. And uh, uh, the national accreditation definitely, as Australia has a single regulator, maybe that uh, makes it easier and institutions are given greater autonomy to self uh, uh, a credit. So th that's interesting coming from India here where we have several regulators as well which are measuring uh, different areas of quality in programs or overall institutional uh, uh, accreditation as well. Now benchmarking is perhaps a culmination of accreditations, internal quality assurance measures and also the, it, it would come to even rankings. So while we go to institutions, I know uh, uh, that we have three institu other institutions on the panel here. I would like you all to also, as you, as you do your four minutes opening, get into how that has helped the institution do better. And of course, do these outcomes actually feature in internationally in various international accreditations and rankings? So for that, I would like to first invite uh, uh, Dr. Tripti to make her four minutes opening. Thank you, Fiki. Thank you, Ashwin. And thank you, respected speakers, for setting up the stage well. So I belong to a university who is health dominated. And I have worked very closely with setting up the curriculum of uh, health related courses and that's with Medical Council of India, now the National Medical Commission. Also working with NAC, also uh, being the director of academic excellence, so working very closely with academics. So I'm trying to triangulate everything together uh, and three, four important principles which I feel I've learned over a period of time. First is that yes, benchmarkings are relevant to an institution because we need to understand where we have to go. So an institution need to have a goal, of course. We all have our goals, we have our values, we have our objectives. The problem is that the benchmarks need to be set contextually. And these contexts are very important when a benchmark is being set. We talk about quality, we talk about a lot of quality assurance, where the benchmark, uh, the, the question of benchmark arises more when we want to sustain and enhance quality. Enhancing is always ever evolving. So in ha it evolves, the curriculum evolves, the teaching learning processes evolves, the student expectations evolve, the governance structure evolves. Now a lot of technology has to be taken up in the curricular transactions. Now all this evolution, how, how you're going to tackle with it? An institution need to have a very, very important developmental roadmap with quality indicators and these indicators need to be very dynamic. Dynamic in the sense that they should be uh, able to incorporate the changing benchmarks. And I say that I totally agree with Dr. Kumar that it should not be the end. Benchmarks, you have to have the quest for excellence. Probably even you, became, you become a benchmark maybe later. So yes, benchmarks are necessary. National as well as international. Why I say international? We have discussed a lot about NAC and NIRF. Well, they are, they are different things, accreditations and rankings altogether. But then why international? Because we are a global family. Why our students, our postgraduate students are moving to foreign universities for taking degrees or for higher education or for more experiential learning? Why not in our country? Why our professionals are not competent globally? Yes, you have to be relevant locally. Your regional, your local relevance is the first criteria. But ultimately, the world is one. We are talking about one health. We are talking about personalized medicine. So we also want that as a person, as an individual, you have to cater to any person. Maybe it's a local or a regional or a national or an interna international level. So we have to make our 
professionals future proof we are using this word a lot professionals future proof but what do we mean by future proof they have to be relevant nationally locally and therefore the international benchmarks are equally relevant equally important even the national education policy when talking about a lot of internationalization this internationalization is what the student mobility not from india to the co different countries but also the inflow is what is we are looking for so i think i have taken my 4 minutes yes, and we'll uh, get yeah so it's a very interesting thought you have on international benchmarks and while i go to my other panelist uh, a thought is there a difference between national benchmarks and international benchmarks are we i'm not saying this are we it's a question for everybody are we lowering the standards with a national benchmark over to uh my panelists please uh, dr nagajyoti korepela for her statements with that with that remark please uh, good afternoon and uh, thanks to fikki for giving this opportunity uh, definitely quality is not an accident it requires lot of enormous and intellectual efforts and uh, previously what happened is whenever the students or parents i uh, used to come and for some admission counseling they used to ask various questions like what is your placement percentage and uh, what is the profile of your teachers uh, can we go and see your laboratories but now the direct question that is given by the parents or students directly is what accreditation you have do you have nac accreditation what is the grade that much awareness has increased among the parents and they are asking my child after ug they want to i mean my child wants to go to abroad for doing uh, uh, later pg studies or phd so that time we definitely require an international ranking so whether you have any international rating or ranking qs etc so many questions are posed by the parents like how every educational institution is having its own quality policy the students and parents are also having their vision mission and traveling with a jet speed and when institutions are not going with that jet speed then they fail to provide the quality education and as uh, some of the panel members said i too agree that definitely there should be a benchmarking because without benchmarking uh, the educational institutions uh, they cannot uh, prepare a road map or a strategic planning initially but definitely they can do much better than the benchmarks so whatever may be the accreditation agencies whether national or international a uh, national let us uh, take nac nba for technical courses and narf ranking and also international ranking the widely uh, noted uh, qs ranking whatever it may be are uh, that certain parameters are very different of course uh, nac uh, i mean it has got uh, seven criteria concentrating on various parameters dr pankaj mittal madam uh, said uh, starting from curriculum aspects to best practices and nb has got 10 criteria nb is for the program nac is for the whole institution that is fine when it comes to international ranking uh, like qs they concentrate more on the reputation when it comes to narf ranking uh, they concentrate even on uh, how uh, the perception uh, is valid for accreditation but whether it is national or international ranking i believe that definitely the curriculum aspects the teaching learning research and what are the extension activities we do and the best practices are definitely important and uh, personally i feel that out of all these criteria uh, the backbone the main stakeholders of any institution the teachers so the faculty profile is very important we at best innovation university apart from uh, recruitment process a stringent recru uh, recruitment process every month there will be a training program for the faculty members fdps are conducted we motivate a lot for the faculty to do the nptel swayam courses because they need to update their knowledge in the recent trends so i do agree that uh, the ranking and benchmarking is important nationally or internationally but however i feel that uh, since we are now following a new education policy we should also think about certain aspects like the multiple entries or multiple exits and uh, i mean pursuing different programs at the same time so we need to include and extend our benchmarking further to improve our quality thank you thank you so much uh, dr nagajyoti i think you kind of reiterated what uh, dr pankaj mittal has also mentioned on accreditation now uh, let me go to dr ragu uh, they have a great nagrade they have got the internal systems there they are well ranked 
So I want to, uh, I want you to do the opening, but please, if you could tell us what has got you there and what will keep you there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin. Dr. Ashwin, do you remember it was eight years ago you came to Amrita, you made your first presentation about QS, and that's the first time we heard about World University rankings and QS. So you started all of these things back then. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, what has got us here? Um, you know, two things happening at uh, Amrita. Internal benchmarks. There is a tremendous focus on uh, our vision, mission. You know, we call it uh, an education for living and an education for life. I, I see the education for living, you know, getting good placements, uh, becoming better, all of those things comes out of an education for living. And that is driven by the external benchmarks. The internal benchmarks is about an education for living. And I actually want to share a quote from our uh, Chancellor Amma. Uh, this is uh, United Nations uh, Academic Impact Summit, uh, July 2015. A little over 700 academicians sitting there, and I will just read out Amma's quote. Uh, today, universities and their researchers are ranked mainly based on the amount of funding they receive, the number of papers they publish, and, but along with this, we should take into consideration how much we have been able to use the research to serve the lowest and the most vulnerable strata of the society. In our approach to sustainable development, we should not forget that it is by strengthening the people at the base of the pyramid that the entire edifice of society grows healthy and strong. I think this is what is the fundamental principle at, at our university, the uh, societal impact, we call it compassion-driven research, sir, you use the word empathy. These kinds of skills, which are very hard to measure, judge by any external benchmarks, that is what is driving us. And uh, more recently, I would say, you know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which was actually adopted at UN in September of 2015, that actually gave us a box, a framework to work towards it. And so benchmarking, very important, but we are far more driven from our internal vision and, and mission. And of course, we continue to play well in the global as well. Thank you. Okay, that's, that's great, it's your internal vision mission. Now, I want to go to the audience here before I go back to my panelists. National or international, what is more important? National benchmarks or international benchmarks? National first? Both, okay. Should they be aligned? I, I would like to have one, if somebody has a controversial thought on that, I would like to give you the mic. Uh, do we have any of our... National international depends on the context. It depends on institutional goals. Uh, they don't have necessarily to be global. Uh, you could be local and you could be doing a fantastic job. And here I refer to what uh, Mr. Matthew said. There is a uh, constant overlap taking place between benchmarks, uh, quality, and ranking. Benchmark is about performing. Quality is essence of process. And ranking is for other commercial reasons. It is not inherent to doing good work, being fair to students, doing good transmission of education to students. Let me put a question to you, Ashwin. You have QS ranking. You disclose 1,000. Does it mean that 500 to 1,000 don't deliver quality education? It may be that 30% of your marking in terms of internationality is not met. Mm -hmm. So they fall down. But that's not essential for doing a great act nationally and being recognized nationally or locally. That's what I have to say. 
Okay, I interesting thought there. Uh, thank you so much for that. Now, I want to, I want to reflect on a statement which uh, Professor Nair made. He said, the notion of doing it better than before. So I, I'll put it up to anybody in the panel. What is the definition of before? Is that also a benchmark? Because if there is a before, it's a standard set. And what is a benchmark? A benchmark is a standard. So if you want to do it better than before, do you still need to have that benchmark then? Because you, it's a tracker where exactly you, you are. So I would not give it to respond, but I want uh, anybody else on the panel to respond, and then maybe we go back to you on that. So anybody from the panel would like to take that? OK, Professor Pankaj. So as uh, told by Dr. Nair, better than before is sort of self-competing. Rather than competing with others, compete with yourself and try to do better than you were doing earlier. But again, to recognize or to understand or to establish that you were somewhere here, so you need some, some sort of benchmarking that I was here, now I have come here. But when you talk of national and international, the first question which you asked, uh, both are important. And but you cannot say that national is inferior to international. That should never be thought of because national is more contextual. International is something which is, I mean, for example, suppose a university in India is doing very good. Can it compete with Harvard? The budget of Harvard is something which is almost equal to the entire education budget of India. So our university, small university, cannot compete with Harvard. Even in the NIRF ranking, it is said that can we compete Based on different parameters, we have different social contexts. We have somebody is located in rural area, poor area, border area. Somebody is in a posh area. They get a lot of funding. We don't get a lot of funding. So how to compete? So ranking is something which is really putting the things off for many people. Benchmarking, of course, is important. Therefore, we, we in our context, we think it is more important uh, to have benchmarking in context of, say, NAC ratings. Because one, it's not the ranking where only one person will hold rank one or two persons will hold rank one. 100 can hold rank one in terms of, say, A double plus scoring. So benchmarking is more important, but ranking is a little bit, at least uh, somewhere I read, why are the rankings so white? So rankings are very white also. So that is also very, very important to see that, that is international ranking is very good for India or national ranking is good enough, or maybe from national to international we can go, but while, while being in a contact, I mean that context has context. to be set. Thank you. Okay, I think Professor Nair wants to uh, make a statement there. Please, uh, yes. if you'd like to respond. Uh, Ashwin, you asked a very interesting question. See, I think there is a distinct difference between uh, benchmarking and doing it better than before. First of all, no measure is absolute. When you say that uh, this is one meter in length, based on what? You know, we used to keep a one meter rod in, in that museum in France. Today, we base that based on the wavelength of certain radioactive material. So just because a measure is a relative one, one cannot argue that that is a benchmarking. So I think we need to be clear here. Benchmarking is, in general, practically accepted. You know, the idea of benchmarking comes from strategic management literature. And benchmarking is all about you identify an entity or a person doing a much, notionally much better than you. You, you mark that and you assess where you are and you think about strategies to get there. There is nothing wrong. You know, it would give you a direction. The problem is that context is quite different. You see, our policymakers, our uh, leaders would look at, look at Stanford. They are, uh, 30, 32 percentage of their uh, university income comes from, probably from um, the corporate uh, consulting. You know, a small university somewhere in a small village in Punjab is not going to meet that. The context is completely different. Once again, I'm telling you, benchmarking is useful, but it would never lead to achieving excellence. Thank you so much. My, my counter question, and I, res I respect what you said, and I'm not representing QS as I'm moderating this, okay? So I'm just independent. Wouldn't you want to be the Stanford of Punjab? No. The, okay, so thank you. Um, is there an asterisk to that? 
Yeah, but I will come back okay, later. I don't I'll, want he'll to respond to the asterisk, the conditions apply yeah, later. Yeah. So, Dr. Tripti, if you'd like to... Just like to put a perspective here because Ashwin and Sarah was talking about. Let's have a perspective, totally different. Let's forget about benchmarks. Now we have a lot of, uh, we all have health issues and we know what are gold standards in treatment, right? So there are gold standards for cardiac uh, infarction management. There are gold standards for shock management. What are these gold standards? They're nothing but benchmarks, right? And these benchmarks are defined based on the evidence which has been collected over a, a period of time over a number of patients and how they have responded to the treatment. And finally, we have come with the benchmarks. Most of these benchmarks are driven by the data which has been collated from foreign universities, not in Indian context. Now, we are following those benchmarks even today to almost 70% of these benchmarks. Now, we have to go ahead of them we have to have our own set of benchmarks. So yes, benchmarks are important because they drove, they drove you. But then you have to set your own context and make your own benchmarks towards excellence. So that's just a perspective which I thought I should share I mean, with the... Quick, quick addition, very quick yeah. addition. So when you talk about uh, those gold standards for uh, medical treatment, even those data come from a certain group of people. Absolutely. If you say that your blood pressure, this is the number, you can go back to the data and see what kind of population we have studied. Exactly. Context is very, very Context important. Context is important and yeah. therefore we need to break the record. Absolutely. That's important. Absolutely. So therefore we have to go beyond that. We have to make our own data statistics. We have to analyze it well. And maybe we, make, we, we set up a new gold standard, which is very typical for our Indian population. That's just a perspective, Ashwin. Okay, so no, there is no, uh, I'm just uh, trying to find out a thought in this, on this panel and in this room on that. So we have established that benchmarking is important, both national and international. So I would like to read a quote uh, from the former president of MIT, okay? Now, because I'm taking the conversation in a different angle now. So MIT, uh, the name of the president is Professor Lester, uh, and he says, Rankings enables us to understand what others think of us. He also adds, does that drive our actions and decision making? No. I think it would probably be a mistake for an institution to base their strategy entirely on what other people think of them. So, like the devil's advocate here, where I would like to anyone, and maybe this one could go to uh, Dr. Raghu because I know your, your thoughts on, on rankings. W what do you think? Do you think rankings are a mirror of what the institution is doing, what, what other people are thinking about, about you? And then, and the quote from the MIT, I actually think they do take rankings very seriously. They may not openly accept. I haven't come across any institution with, with whatever limited that I have interacted with them, that anybody who does not take ranking uh, seriously, especially if you are fallen behind, uh, there's going to be a, a meeting right after the results were announced. Uh, and so uh, I think the same at Amrita, as I said, there is internal benchmarks that are driven completely by the vision mission of the institution. We have not deviated from that, but at the same time we are playing in an increasingly a uh, flat world and its global impact is there. So we just cannot uh, not look at the uh, international rankings. And that particular one on the uh, India versus uh, international, and what we have found, you know, NIRF, they probably are far more balanced than any other uh, rankings that we have seen, specifically, you know, QS and THE and, and others. So I would say in the Indian context, also even in the uh, global context, NIRF could be expanded and we start uh, ranking uh, universities abroad based on some of the NIRF parameters also. It, I think it has got that kind of uh, diversity in its, its parameters there. Okay, uh, I, w I would like to come to you as well in, a, in just a short while. But you did say we could expand NIRF internationally. Now, if we did that, uh, the faculty student ratio, now as a benchmark, I'm just giving a number, Stanford has a faculty student ratio of four students to one faculty member. Would they score more than our, I mean, the, the set benchmark 
in NRF is 15, uh, 15 is to 1. So what would happen to an institution like Stanford then? No, no you're right. You know, uh, so at that point, we look to see what are some uh, prevalent ratios that are already there. For example, Caltech probably is uh, 4 is to 1 or, or even, even better than that one. And, uh, and who has fixed these weightages and marks? There is obviously no science behind it. One of them have 20%, other one has 10%. One person says papers per faculty, other person says citations per paper, other person says citations per faculty. Uh, there are no standards for any of these. You know, very honestly, for us, it's quite a difficult job when all these ranking agencies are there and so many parameters. That is when we stopped, you know, trying to address each one of them and see what is important for an institution locally. So from rankings, I have a thought. I'll come back to you in a, in a short while. Now, Philip Altbach, who's a quite renowned uh, writer and a Boston College professor, uh, in the Journal of International Higher Education, he wrote, everyone wants to be a world-class university. Do you have world-class in or, uh, whoever owns a university or a uh, vice chancellor works at a university? The word world-class is there somewhere in the vision, mission, or in about us, or somewhere. Agree? I mean, unless we have some universities here who are, who are not aspiring to, to be that. He also adds, no country feels it can do without one. The problem is that no one knows what a world-class university is, and no one has figured out how to get to one. OK? With that, let's go to Australia back again, because Australia has got <laughs> In the rankings, the definition at least got some world-class universities. So would you like to uh, uh, reflect on that thought of Philip Albach? Look, it's a really good point, actually. I was kind of laughing at the, at the quote and trying to sort of think about it in, um, in an Australian context. I and mean, I guess you're right, under the international rankings, we do pretty well. We're a country of 25 million people. There in the Southern Hemisphere, in an island, we cling to the coast, but we do have well-reputed... Uh, universities in the top 100, for example, you know, any of the different companies you can kind of look at. Do you know what, though? My perspective as a government policymaker and what the Australian government did when it set up our national quality assurance framework in around 2010, 2011, didn't really care about international rankings. It actually focused on the student, the institutions, creating a process to kind of interrogate and look at risk with the outcomes we're trying to get to and really focused in on the actual university and what it's supposed to deliver for students. We have a parallel sort of, I guess, ranking or benchmarking, um, probably more a benchmarking, you would say, I think, Ashwin, based on your sort of definition at the beginning, um, set of criteria for research. So we have... Um, an excellence framework for measuring research output in Australia. And you can look at it by discipline. It's all publicly available. You can look at it by discipline, the university. You can even look down to the researcher. And if you have a look at that, those universities from Australia that are overall, say, in the top 100 of, of QS, and those that aren't, some of them will have some of Australia's top rated for excellence research outputs which look at things like internationalization and otherwise. So a university that may be in the, the 200 to 300 globally could be Australia's most excellent researcher in marine science. And in fact, it is. It is not one of our top 100. And so that's why if you look at it from a, from an, I'm a policymaker, I'm a bureaucrat, so I always look at these things from that perspective. What we want and what the Australian government wants through our legislation on quality assurance is our students to achieve and well, to have good employability outcomes. And if they want to go on and be an academic, they've got a good basis for doing high quality research later on. So I think international rankings, yes, they're important. And a lot of our unis will look at different rankings for when they find partnerships here in India. And they do go into sort of micro detail and looking at these things. And we talked to Dr. Mittal and to the UGC and others about, you know, how to find those ones. And people don't go and partner wholly with the top ranks. Yes, of course. But others where there are expertise as well. So I think it's far more complicated. And I think from a government perspective, we, we wouldn't just look at international rankings as a way of measuring quality and output um, because... Uh, it will um, skew the market and lock out students 
um, from, from university uh, that otherwise should go to university. Thank you so much. So the role of, uh, I, I think we are trying to also look at, I was trying to look back at the theme of the session, which is empowering excellence. Okay, and we are not here to say which, um, I, don't, I don't think we are here to say either uh, accreditation works, doesn't work. We are here to see the usefulness of all these QA models, be it accreditation, be it rankings, uh, be it local quality assurance, all have a role to play somewhere in the system. Uh, I, I would like to go over to uh, Dr. Uh, Nagajoti for her thoughts on uh, the, the framework which framework do you think, what's the order of framework for an institution to establish? Is it first your getting your, because what is benchmarking? And I think, um, is benchmarking just internal? It, because it does provide an impetus for change and it can also be self-analyzing. So what is, do we need to separate them all out? Do we need to separate quality assurance from benchmarking? I, I, what are your thoughts on that, uh, uh, particularly? Yes, uh, regarding this, as a young university, I can answer this because we definitely require a strong internal quality assurance even before starting any accreditation process or ranking. And definitely first within the institution, it should be ensured. Then we can think about calling the external agencies for uh, some one decade back, uh, everybody were talking about ISO, ten, uh, two decades back. So that was said to uh, check the standards. So uh, initially we can go for the program wise accreditation NBA and then we can go for the overall uh, institutional accreditation. Once we are happy with the grade or ranking whatever we get, then we can go for the international because directly going for the international uh, rating or thing, we may not meet the standards. And what I'm observing as a NACPIR team member, when I go for institutions uh, uh, for inspection, there will be a lot of display boards uh, regarding quality policy, saying, as sir said, world-class uh, institution, world-class quality education. But there is no measurement for that. And definitely, internal quality assurance uh, makes the efforts. And one more thing is, since there are so many accreditation agencies and uh, ranking uh, uh, once we go to the website of some higher education institution, you know that uh, the uh, ranking system is very transparent. Every institution, they have to display their SSR or SAR on their website. But when we go and see these things, what we feel is the data given in SAR is totally different for the same year. The data given in SSR is totally different for the same year. And the NARF ranking, the data is given is different and there is no check for this. So why this happens is also another question. Why? Because uh, NARF is handled by a different coordinator in a college. NAC is handled by a different college. And there is no centralized uh, data center to captivate all the data at a common place. So they are doing it very independently and giving the data. And uh, they, it's not checked once again. So first, these things to be ensured. There should be only one data for a particular institution. So suppose a college is having 50 faculty, that should be same everywhere. But it is not the same uh, when we see in practice. Thank you so much. Yeah, we had a discussion, uh, we had a round table uh, on the 28th, which actually had the same thoughts on a common data set. So to enable benchmarking, whether we have quality assurance, we're looking at uh, different other models like accreditation and rankings, do we conclude on one particular, do we at least agree that to enable better benchmarking, and I'm not saying competition, uh, I'm saying benchmarking, do we need first a common data set? Because I know Australia has a common, at least the reporting is, is common across and the number you submit into the, the, for the national accreditation has to be the same you submit onto uh, international rankings and it can be clearly, clearly um, uh, found out. So what, what do you think, Professor Pankaj, on, on this one? And how do you think the role of and the association in that, perhaps. See, of course, common data set is very, very important. And the uh, government of India is talking about one nation, one data. So every university, because not only the discrepancies in the data, which is given to various agencies, it is a very big burden on the institutions to keep on filling data for different agencies. Therefore, one nation, one data is something which is very welcome, and India is working towards that. And very soon we will be having that. But your question about like, I feel that institutions should be concentrating on quality 
about quality assurance mechanisms and not run after rankings. Ranking should be a byproduct. So the work should be towards the quality because I have seen many institutions who are doing very good work, who are very good, but they are not able to present well, therefore they are lacking in ranking. So ranking doesn't only depend upon how good you are, it also depends upon how good you are in presenting your things. So ranking, we should not be running after ranking, we should be running after establishing quality assurance mechanism in our own institutions and concentrate on uh, quality and ranking will come on its own, whether it is national or international, it will come on its own provided you are having quality. Okay, great. So we need to run after quality, not rankings. Rankings is the outcome of whatever the institution is doing. Uh, now, with that, I think there was a statement uh, Dr. Raghu wanted to make. Uh, um, you want, you had a... Uh. Very quickly on that uh, one nation, one portal. And, and somewhere uh, from what my limited understanding, it is still falling short. You know, look at uh, an institution like Amrita. UGC, we have to cater to AICT, Pharmacy Council, and Dental we Council, we NMC, Ayush, and the list goes on. Uh, so the portal is able to collect some basic data, but if the commonality of all of those councils is not brought forward, then our situation doesn't improve much. So I just hope that, you know, that also is there in the roadmap there. Otherwise, you know, so much time we spend on just data collection and we are all over the map. Okay, with that, we are almost at the halfway mark uh, of this panel, and I would like to have some thoughts from the audience, uh, particularly on are we looking at benchmarking slightly differently? Because w what we see is that there are different definitions of benchmarks. Uh, well, we could use local, we could do domestic, we could do international, and rankings doesn't seem to fall under the benchmarking category. Do you all agree? that maybe benchmark needs to be separated and QA is not a benchmark, but it's a minimum standards to have. Any thoughts from my audience here? For our audience here, sorry. Yes, please. If you could identify yourself first, we can give you the mic. Uh, this is Raj from British Council. Uh, very happy to kind of uh, you know listen to the deliberations. I think uh, I would submit that benchmarking and accreditation should be a means. They are not an end in itself. And uh, my only submission to the panel will be that if you had to look at the the range of institutions that we work, uh, they are at a different journey points uh, in their cycle of sort of being excellent or also in continuing their cycle of continued excellence. So if you had to kind of uh, give maybe three nuggets of wisdom, how do you continue your journey to sort of continue your cycle of continued excellence? Uh, what would that be specifically speaking for, let's say the bottom of pyramid institutions who have aspiration, who have uh, futuristic thoughts to be nationally comparable as well as internationally, uh, you know, looking at comparability and international participation. Uh, any thoughts on that? Anybody from the panel would like to take that? Uh, I think Professor Nair, if you'd like to give you three nuggets on uh, this. Yeah. Uh, you know, just before that, just like uh, you were uh, uh, challenging our thought on what is world class, actually, what is quality? We also use that term as if we know it. If you go back to Ed uh, Deming's definition of quality, mm -hmm. it has two uh, major uh, dimensions, usefulness and affordability. So Maruti 800 used to be one of the highest quality cars produced ever. So, but our notion of quality is uh, BMW is better quality than Maruti. So this idea of notion of quality itself is, uh, we, are, we use that word, but uh, we don't actually um, you know, understand it that well. So going back to this question, if you look at uh, some of the Western accreditation agencies, they don't go with uh, some kind of a set standard. For example, I work with, uh, the business school, I work with uh, AACSB. 
even though getting accreditation is a little bit tricky and nuanced but they would ask you you know what is your uh, mission what is your uh, vision you state it and show us these processes we are following to get there so they are not benchmarking it should be but look at our agencies accreditation agencies it is the same standard for all so that is where the context comes to play and uh, you your question about that uh, small university in punjab would never become uh, stanford but they could be the most useful learning center for the local population you know what see one um, important point all of us should remember all of us cannot be number one when we think about ranking it's a zero sum game but at the same time all of us the whole world all of us can have a decent life if we can think beyond uh, the standard norms you know it is way more philosophical than uh, this little uh, things uh, we discuss we need uh, as much philosophy as pragmatism thank you uh let's take uh, dr vidya has her hand up uh if before we, okay we have the gentleman right there if you could identify yourself first well, introduce yourself well please. i'm uh, dr c k bharadwaj working on spiritual literacy i would like to say something from gita 7th chapter 2nd shloka talks about that the benchmark is uh, after knowing nothing remains to be known except living that knowledge and exploring it into your day to day life so that is what is a benchmark that that is how we would like that the student should be master of all and jack of none and how this can be achieved by giving them that knowledge with which they can see as i always say that the attention is an outer expression like an omni scanner which can scan the information the mind has got and how to really pick up that right information to work on it and to have that excellence in each field wherever one is working thank you thank you so much uh, dr vidya thank you ashwin uh, nice to listen to another discourse on benchmarking uh, but uh, my personal opinion is uh, you know benchmarking is at various levels at an individual at an organizational which is university and even at a nation level you know so today even indian government wants to benchmark its higher education with the best in the world and why do you think we are all talking about rankings accreditation more importantly rankings we never i mean i don't think any forum for the last 18 years out of 18 years i think it's only this, since the last 2 to 3 years we are discussing rankings benchmarkings before that indian higher education was as good may not be <laughs> you know may not be at the level of what it is today with the new education policy but certainly we were doing well our students were happy they were getting jobs but i think it's always a quest for excellence and i think this is for example i am a medical doctor and she gave a, an excellent uh, example if i have done and, and i'm a gynecologist by training so if i did a cesarean or any surgery in a certain way uh, you know i would always benchmark that with someone who did it uh, in a probably in a better way though the steps are the same the surgical uh, steps would be the same but still i would like to do it better in the you know quest of excellence to do something so at an individual level it could be that at a university level obviously you want to benchmark your university why university even at a program level you want to benchmark right when you yeah, when you create a new program you always look at benchmarks and say that can my program be as good as someone else's and when you say someone else's means probably that is the standard that you want your program to be at and it could be different for different universities right so it it need not be the same benchmark for everyone and then uh, but of course i don't believe in national and international because i think the quest for excellence is the quest for excellence and it doesn't really matter whether you're comparing with anybody you first compare with yourself as dr nayar very rightly said and then compare yourself with whatever benchmark that you have set for yourself or your university has set for you so one of the thought uh, i'll come to you but i i want to go back to the thought but i found it very interesting i've been thinking about it is the the quality the word quality so if you remove quality or quality assurance from benchmarking so is quality assurance separate from benchmarking and on your thought of accreditation we have an we have an accreditation agency also inside here uh, an international accreditation agency so i would like you to uh, nitesh if you like to quickly respond 
on the quality aspect in international accreditations. Uh, respond to and share some, throw some light on prof what Professor Nair said. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, I represent uh, EFMD from European Union. And I think I agree to all of you. And uh, one of the most important things is that we do many great things as an institution every day. But how many of them are we really recording? How many of them are we really trying to build up? So what we are trying to say that uh, one of the parameters for us is uh, internationalization. So when we say internationalization, it is not about passport counting. It is about how many dimensions of internationalization are you orienting your graduate for a global uh, workforce, right? So you would do some languages, you would do some international uh, uh, events, you would do some international courses, you would do some international residency, you would do some international faculty, you would do some research which is having a global impact. So there could be many dimensions. And then we are saying that, okay, whether you're doing this 10%, 20%, 30%, 100%, depending upon your strategy is what you measure. So what we are just trying to say that by virtue of quality assurance or benchmarking, we are trying to enable you, one, think, at, think in those dimensions which you probably have not thought, and two, trying to I mean, help you look at that, okay, globally this is what is happening. We're not saying do this only, then you'll be accredited. No, there are great schools who are accredited in, in India, and there are very great schools which are accredited in most of the countries that we operate in. But, I mean, by having a great process, having a great system in place, having a right strategy in place, you could get there. So that is what I think the process of accreditation, if I were to, I mean, share a very smart, uh, small. Spread. That's an EFMD process. So yes. you're, you're from EFMD. Yeah. Um, do you, and uh, another quick one for you, do you believe accreditation international versus domestic? What's your thought on that so we can all, all okay. know? Okay, so one word on us, I would say we are highly qualitative and contextualized. So whenever we are operating, I mean, uh, in Europe, I mean, people would say, okay, I mean, it's very easy. Within two hours, you are in two, I mean, 20 different countries. In India, in two hours, you are probably still not even left Delhi. Forget <laughs> going to another state, you know. So, I mean, we understand the context. And in everything that we do, we would always have a strong degree of the local representation in trying to create those uh, assessments. The criteria may look very similar. It's very simple to say corporate engagement, ESG, governance, uh, diversity, I mean, faculty uh, research, but the way they are measured, the way they are contextualized, and then having an impact, I mean, it's all very articulate. And the first, imp uh, the most important thing I would say that whenever whoever is interacting with us, if we are telling you you are not there, we are telling you in black and white. We are not just saying you're not good. You are, we are telling you these are the areas to improve. So that, that's when you kind of work on that and then you come back and then we help you, mentor, coach you, do everything to bring you to that level. Okay, thank you so much. There's a, qu uh, there's a show of hands, yes, please. Uh, thank you to the panel. Very interesting session on benchmarking and rankings. I have a, uh, my name is Suchita Gokarn and I represent the government of New South Wales, Australia. So I have a completely disruptive question, if I may. And uh, no, um, uh, it's nothing to do with QS and their rankings. But this is a very personal opinion that today rankings are more of a marketing tool. What does the panel have to say to that, especially international rankings? What are your thoughts? In terms of India as a country, we're very different. Uh, so for us, contextually, it is the best you can be and the best you can be in your context, which should drive excellence and quality. So like your views on rankings and would you think in terms of them being a marketing tool as opposed to quality, excellence, and outcomes? So I would like to add to that question, then we'll, we'll have a round, because I realize time is uh, really uh, running by, and we sh will be sh soon at our al allocated time. So do we need to remove rankings out of the benchmarking definition? Uh, is, is that, and accreditation as well? Because what I'm hearing more from our panel is the internal where you know where you benchmark against external peers, where you do what you do internally is benchmarking. Quality assurance, accreditation does aid in benchmarking. Rankings, I hear, is more of an outside and external mirror of what the institution is doing and helps in marketing. So do we remove 
that out and I will, uh, I, w I have seen some more hands, but I want to give an opportunity for all our panelists to respond within a minute, please, starting from Dr. Nagar Jyoti, please. I do not say that we do not uh, require accreditation or benchmarking, but uh, what I would like to say is, uh, even now after getting a A++ accreditation or NARF top 50, even the teacher in the class, just two days before the exams, uh, she is explaining about uh, the important questions which are going to come after two days. But this will not definitely improve their critical thinking or uh, what we say is uh, cognitive or metacognitive skills. So the teaching methodology, every, it should be changed totally based on quality, not uh, just for ranking. But however, we require ranking to, uh, or uh, accreditation to justify where we are. And even uh, the uh, stakeholders should know where the college is or the university is. Over to Dr. Raghu, again my question uh, is, do we need to remove rankings and accreditation and quality assurance out, out of the benchmarking domain? No, the an answer is uh, no. We, we keep it there and to answer Madam's question, you know, yes, it is mostly uh, a marketing tool. That is how at least at Amrita we are seeing this one. But uh, Dr. Ashwin, just one question I'll park with you and when you get a chance. Recently, there's quite a phenomenon where a number of top tier institutions who have been giving data to ranking agencies, they have come out of it. Stanford Medical has come out of it, Yale Law School has come out of it, several universities in China. And if they were marketing, using this as a marketing tool, these are top tier institutions. They said, no, we don't care. We want to come out of it. I'll just park that question with you. If there is an opportunity, we'll come to that. We will ask QS about it after the panel is finished. Okay, this is for Dr. Going back to your uh, uh, question, uh, it's a difficult one. At least my experience with uh, several international accreditation agencies like uh, EFMD, AACSB, and uh, engineering accreditation, EBET, I can definitely, you know, there's some marketing uh, branding aspect to it, but my experience is our processes have improved. Definitely, without without question, because they work with you, like uh, Nish Nishit was telling, they work with you. Ranking, unfortunately, it is mostly a, a marketing tool. I'm not telling uh, uh, it would not help us in, say, for example, for my university, Thapar Institute of Engineering and Technology, NAR ranking is helping me as the head of the university to get more money for our PhD program. It's, uh, so it is, in some sense, helping me to really do the right thing for the university with respect to research. Thank you. So Ashwin, I feel they are both important for benchmarking, but unfortunately, both are being used as marketing tools. So when you see the advertisements of all the universities, A double plus ranking flashes on the top, ranking wherever they are standing flashes on the top, so it's, it's used as a marketing tool because sometimes uh, that A double plus or that ranking which they are flashing internally, maybe they are not even worth of it, but that is used as a uh, sort of a branding material for the university. So they are important for benchmarking, but shouldn't be used as marketing tools by ranking agencies as well as the universities. Okay. <laughs> well, I agree with Dr. Mittal. I mean, clearly there, marketing tools, because that's how people in terms of the, the marketplace, and if you think about students as consumers, and I don't like commodifying you know, people in this way, but this is what those ranking systems are about. They're about trying to attract people. Universities all find where they're best ranked in whatever uh, ranking system they can uh, whether it be, you know, the ones from China or the global ones that others are aspiring to. Um, interestingly, um, I don't know if it's interesting actually, it might not be, so you can decide. Um, we don't have rankings in our accreditation system in Australia, so we don't have AA++ or any of these kinds of things. Um, you're either, um, you can be self-accrediting, which our universities are, or a lot of our thousands of colleges which will have a regular uh, audit placed upon them. So we don't have any sort of rankings. They're not within the Australian system. You know, our number one university under QS or Times or whatever, you know, they won't have a number under our domestic system. So they're either accredited 
and therefore able to deliver and are trusted to deliver high quality education to students both in Australia and from students all around the world, or they're not. Um, the rankings come in, at least for an Australian system, as a way of attracting and sort of explaining where they are in the world. But I don't really think, and I think a lot of Australian universities would argue this, except for maybe the top 100, um, the seven in the top 100, um, they're not a good reflection of what a student can achieve um, generally. So adding to the panel, of course, uh, it has become a marketing strategy, but clearly that was not the intention. Uh, just to add to it, there are a lot of things to be learned from ranking as well. Just my example of uh, our university recently participated in Times Impact Rankings, where we really came to know that there are sustainable goals. There are 17 SDGs, and we have to work on those SDGs because that is one of the things where you need to contribute as a university, as an organization. And we realized that this, uh, these SDGs cannot be, you cannot contribute it individually unless you cooperate. So the SDG 17, where you know the partnership for goals is the main SDG. So yes, we learn a lot from the parameters which are there in rankings as well. But unfortunately, what has happened is that rankings are now being more of a marketing strategy from students' perspective, which we need to really uh, not take much, we not, need not give much heed to it, but rather try to learn more from it. And I would also like to emphasize one point here, that national rankings, Yes, they have taken the Indian context into consideration, but when we talk about international rankings, of course, India has never been a context. So therefore, those parameters probably, we will never be able to make up to that level because it was not, say, uh, we, were we were talking about one is to four student-teacher ratio. Can you imagine it here? So we cannot. So for us, international rankings, with Indian perspective, that needs to be defined. Ashwin, can I be a bit cheeky? Sure. And, um, and ask, do we know what students think in terms of these international rankings? Are they really that convincing for the selection of a university or a program? I'm really interested. Sure. So uh, what, I've, what I've, I've presented something, uh, I've presented some data when we were at Symbiosis with the Australian delegation last time. Last, it was at the Symbiosis conference. And we've seen uh, rankings comes in the first two for Indian students, affordability is important, but also the ranking of the institution is important. Despite uh, whatever we say today, it does look like students are looking at that. But beyond that, there are about another 10 more indicators where students are looking at uh, for, for these things through the study, which was done uh, across the board with, uh, with different other students. Uh, we, have, we, have, we are almost at time, but I've seen, I've seen, uh, we have already given you opportunities. I'm going to see if there's, uh, I've seen uh, somebody's hand up. Professor Sovic, is it? Yeah, okay. If you could uh, introduce yourself to the rest if they don't know you. Um, I'm not responding to any of the questions. Um, two quick observations. Uh, when I talk to uh, several of my friends in the leading U US universities, I get the feeling that they they don't pay much attention to QS and THE ranks at all, rankings at all. They do pay a little bit of attention to US News and World Report, which is sort of local, and but it has also has gone into some trouble recently. But uh, it's not really occupying, uh, you know, their central thoughts and anything like that. The other quick observation in the interest of time is uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, very good state universities, you know, land grant large state universities, whose student faculty ratio is between 18 and 20. They are extremely strong universities, uh, leading IIT students would love to do their masters and PhD there. But this student faculty ratio, uh, you know, it's just as a number, it doesn't work. You have to, it, it is a little more complex than that. How do you conduct your pedagogy? How do you, what are the other things? What are the tutorial class sizes, et cetera? But our accreditation and ranking agencies are stuck on that single number. I think it's very unintelligent, to say the least. OK. Uh, there is one from uh, Dr. Pankaj there, yes? Yeah, yeah. Please. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to say uh, I'm currently with OP Jindal Global University, but I also do education consulting with many different tier of universities. So I'd like to share with you that uh, many of the owners, they look at this whole exercise, it is an expenditure. They do not look at it as an investment. 
So I remember when I was in the British Council uh, advisory group, when we started implementing the CSR initiative. So we build a case that how it can be a responsible business, how it make a good business case. In the same way, I believe there is a need to do a lot of work on that what kind of benefit, tangible and intangible, including the life cycle value of a satisfied student. Because in US, a lot of money is coming from grant and those kind of money which people are giving later on. And currently, our Indian founder, they know only one way, okay, how much money is coming from the tuition or how much money is coming from research or grant. So we need to also look into that possibility that what a great value is being created when you create a wonderful student who is going as an advocate from you. And also building a case around, you know, how you can just take it forward in that way. And also there is very big variety of institutions like level C to level D and B and A. So what is fitting for level A set will not appeal to level D. They will feel it is a very big thing to go to level A. So they will rather drop the whole idea because I deal with many different kind of owners. So I'm sharing this insight with you. So there has to be multiple kind of thing. Okay, you are a D, now you can go to a C. Now, oh, wow, you've got, got it. Now you go to levels B. Rather than going directly that you have to achieve and go to the Everest. So I believe uh, this kind of hand-holding approach is needed. Also, there are a lot of good kind of leaders are needed who can handhold the vice chancellors. Because many of the vice chancellors, they have been like a good teachers, but they have not worked in teams. They do not know how, how to manage university on a balance scorecard model. So maybe these things can also be uh, considered yeah. later. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, just like earlier, one of the panelists said, everybody wants to be number one and also everybody wants to be A plus or A plus plus. So with that, it might be difficult to have this model uh, of uh, trying to put people through different uh, stages because nobody will accept. I, I believe and no, nobody would accept uh, a B grade or a C or, or uh, A grade because there is A plus. My neighbor has an A plus uh, plus as well. So uh, as we conclude this panel, uh, I think it's a great discussion. We have talked a lot about uh, benchmarking and how quality assurance uh, is a part of it, along with accreditation and rankings as a whole. Uh, but of course, the roles of each of these uh, systems are different. The outcomes are different. And uh, even though we would like to benchmark internationally, get international rankings, uh, it, we should start first at home with our local accreditation, the local rankings. And I think NRF does a great job on that, trying to get the, everybody into the mood of rankings, at least, uh, compared to many years before. Uh, and from what we see currently uh, across the room, there seems to be definitely the appetite to benchmark. Uh, and benchmark is not only at home, but also uh, amongst peers. And I think everybody kind of echoes the thoughts also of the MIT uh, former president, uh, Lester, which says that you know rankings are a, a mirror. Uh, but perhaps something not where institutions have to run behind it. Uh, they're the outcomes of what accreditations and uh, quality assurance does in the benchmarking uh, field. Uh, great to learn about Australia's system of uh, self-accreditation. I don't know when we would have the opportunity to introduce that in, in India, where we'll have institutions self-accredit themselves and also do that for others. So it's something, I think, for the future to, to learn and maybe... Uh, you know, the thought uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Nair has on excellence, we could redefine that in the future. So thank you very much for all your thoughts. The, the topic of um, a common data set is something which has again echoed out of all of this uh, and we'll take this back uh, and a lot more discussions to be held on the student outcomes because I think the student, we have forgotten the student in this entire process, right? So this is part one of our uh, panel, hopefully to have part two at another event uh, with uh, our great uh, panelists here who have uh, contributed to the discussion. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much indeed. I would now request our eminent panel to kindly come together for a group photograph. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we close this session, I have two very important announcements to make. First and foremost, we have a 20 minutes short tea break, after which we move back to Bhim Hall for the next session. And secondly, we have sent online the feedback forms to everyone. We would request you to kindly spare a few minutes and fill in the feedback form and send it to us. 
feedback from you is very very important for us to improve our performance our shortcomings whatever they were in our upcoming events thank you very much indeed so looking forward to seeing you all in 20 minutes in beam hall for the next session which is also the last of the panel discussion sessions of this two day summit thank you